how and what were their beliefs regarding the criticism regarding drama regarding what kind of uh, discourse in literary discourse should be is ideal as plato said poetry is not ideal but later his own disciple disciple uh, aristotle he said that poetry and imitation is a kind of you know higher kind of uh, pleasure it provides so poet should not be banished from this thing so when we talk about discourse what are the modes of discourse so there are many modes of discourse one of a very popular one is narration that is storytelling see uh, if you if you have heard the name of yuval noah harari uh, who has written sapiens and who has written about the world history he says that in the world the whole world the way you tell the stories make you successful that means homer and iliad who told their stories they became successful in the same way in india ramayana and mahabharat these are the most successful stories which were told in a uh, in such a manner that for ages it has been told and even today they are popular second way of discourse is descriptions like descriptions of places persons various characters third is exposition this is a greek word based on greek word exposition means to place a person things settings action action etc in a particular manner that is exposition the fourth way of discourse is argument when you make an argument then it is naturally it should be based on logic some kind of logic is there without logic you, you cannot make a strong argument so uh, the person who is writing argument making argument he tries to convince through logic and that is why it is called thesis whenever we are writing a thesis even when we are doing some research it is based on logic see nowadays very few people know how a research should be followed it should be pursued rather right when you are writing a research or even a research paper there should be an argument and you argue about and you argue either in favor of your proposition or against the proposition right so you have to consider both the pros and cons and you have to make arguments on the basis of evidences it is not a simple argument for uh, without having any evidence or without without having any uh, logical support then now uh, which is more prevalent on tvs and uh, other places debate debate is also one of the most popular discourse nowadays now in greek terms when you are doing this discourse there are these terms which are very very popular and which should be understood by us one as i told you logic that is logos on the basis of logic you can make some discourse then when you are explaining something when i am trying to explain something and if you don't understand if you go on arguing or if you go on asking questions then there might be some pathos you know i have to take some pains to explain my argument then the third one is ethos ethos means i want to suggest that i am honest person and my argument it should be you know i when i want to convince you i try to convince you on my ethos on my intentions that i am a pure i am an honest person and there are no other intentions while making some arguments the last one is mythos so on the basis of mythos means mythology that is every country's culture, cultural heritage is based on mythology and that is why when you see this kathakas when they tell kathas bhagavad katha ram katha 
they tell you the mythological stories right shiva and parvati and all that ram and sita hmm for us ram and sita or shiva and parvati parvati which we consider the puranas and our scriptures our history so we don't tell that mythology but still in greek mythology also when you use some mythology it becomes stronger your argument becomes stronger so this is something regarding the modes of various discourse now when we talk about literary studies or literary criticism am i audible yes, yes ma'am ma yes ma'am okay so these literary studies in the first part of the 20th century were dominated by what are now we call them traditional approaches now what are these traditional approaches and why they are called traditionals because in later part of the 20th century as i told you in america the new critics it was a group of critics actually there was not no school of new critics but they spontaneously they started thinking in the way they thought right and they believed that this extrinsic approach to literature is not proper now what is this extrinsic approach extrinsic means external something which is coming from outside now outside means what now these new critics they believe that there should be only and only the text which should be considered for the criticism while this traditional approach is they considered historical biographical social and other elements other other background or other information <coughs> which was available about the author about the text uh, whatever uh, events were responsible the, for the particular write up or the text so that was called a uh, traditional approach now they focus on understanding literary works by bringing external information to bear on them rather than by close and careful consideration of what is already expressed in the work itself now these are the two poles one is traditional and second as i told you the new critics now the new critics they consider only and only the work the written work it may be a poem it may be a novel it may be a short story whatever literary yoner as you know there are so many yoners but when we talk about any particular text it can be a poem a drama whatever a play or a novel or a short story anything right but this traditional approaches the the critics who believed in traditional approaches for evaluation of the text they consider this external information which was available and which was useful also right so that does not mean that they were not reading the text itself closely they read the text closely but as well as they applied the knowledge of the background they applied the information which was available to them regarding a particular text right uh, now suppose if any such information is not available and only on the basis of the text which is available to you you have to evaluate or you have to interpret the text how would you do it i have taken one example of kubla khan and that kubla khan which was written by st college this is just a picture i got when i wrote in google regarding the kubla khan now kubla khan is a poem i i won't tell you the other things first but you can see a palace like structure in the background there is a hill right there is a river and there are trees and kind of forest in the picture and there are two girls right two female characters are seen in this picture okay now if we go directly to the text 
this is the title kubla khan or a vision in a dream so the title itself suggests many things it is a vision in a dream a fragment so this poem is a fragment it is a vision seen in a dream the poet himself st college himself has mentioned you that this is a poem which was seen as a dream as a vision and which is fragmentary now let us read the poem i know most of you will not be uh, able to understand what it means okay but let us make it try in zanadu did kubla khan a stately pleasure dome decreed where alf the sacred river ran through caverns bezelless to men down to a sunless sea so twice 5 miles of fertile ground twice 5 miles of fertile ground that means 10 miles with walls and towers were girdled around and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills sinuous rills means rills means the streams where blossomed many and incense bearing trees and here were forest ancient as the hills and folding sunny spots of greenery but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a sudden cover a savage place as holy and enchanted this is not the full poem right this is a piece of the poem i have selected because if i take the complete poem it will be two three pages two three slides rather now what you uh, see is the description of the picture you have seen if i don't tell you about the background did you get anything out of these words please tell me any one or two or three no ma'am right uh, it's impossible <laughs> huh impossible impossible if you don't show the picture we can't understand this no poem. picture is okay study. fine but uh, still i have not given you the background so yeah, when yeah. i i am not giving you the background how much of these words could you make out mm, no nothing we can't find now let me tell you the background of this poem yeah as i told you st coleridge had an opium okay he had taken opium and he was sitting in this place somewhere right and he had a vision like this he had a dream like vision right and he was just he he decided to take a pen and write down this thing now what happened he wrote down this this much of lines and after that one person a business person came to him he just disturbed him he asked him some questions you know some business questions and then went away now after that for coleridge it became very difficult to recollect what he had seen in the dream so he it was almost you know uh, he was unable to write down the whole poem which he had visualized so uh, if you read the whole pe- poem you can see the difference you can see there is a fragment right now if you don't get this background this uh, what we say biographical information regarding kubla khan regarding st coleridge's own experience how would you be able to understand this poem okay and why he feel this a place as a savage play savage place and he feel it is holy as well as enchanted right so all these what we call extrinsic elements or external elements external information they help you to understand the whole text otherwise without the help of this kind of information how you can understand a poem how much you can 
uh, what do we say, interpret the poem? And how can you write a critical appreciation of it? Shridi Rani is a teacher, so she knows. Uh, she must be telling her students, write a critical appreciation of this poem. Right? So, yes, when, <laughs> so if you provide this kind of background to the students, they will be able to write something. Okay, this was the situation. S.T. Coleridge had taken an opium and he was in such a, uh, what we say, stage of... Um, trance he went into Just trance see. and then he visualized this kind of dream and then he started writing but again there was some disturbance a person came there was a conversation and because of that conversation whatever he had seen in his dream he could not recollect later on so this was a and that is why there is a kind of break in the uh, what we call the poem the same mood is not continued, right? So, as this trend, uh, traditional uh, theorist or traditional approaches, they believe that this kind of information, background, social, biographical, and sometimes even political background do affect the poet or the writer. And that is why this kind of information make you understand the work in a better manner. Do you agree to it or not? We'll take another example also later on. So to a certain extent, all approaches to literature are by definition extrinsic because a reader must have a certain basic information at hand to read a literary work at all. At the very least, a reader must know the language in which the work is written and must possess a certain basic amount of cultural knowledge. See, while whoever, whoever have studied English literature, being an Indian, you always face some, some kind of problem in understanding the text because so many th things which are associated with their culture, with their religion, you can't understand. I remember one of uh, uh, W.B. Yeats' poem which was taught to us by our professor, learned professor, Dr. Digish Mehta at that time. And he asked one question. There was a word Jesuit. J-E-S-U-I-T. Now, while teaching this poem, he asked one question to the class. What do you understand by this word Jesuit? Now, he showed a finger to me and I said, sir, no. Sorry, I don't understand. I don't know what is the meaning of this word. Then she asked one girl, Jenny Rathod. She was our classmate and she was the gold medalist of our, uh, that batch. So he asked him, she, he asked her, what is the meaning of Jesuit? She said, I don't know, sir. Then he asked, because she was a Xavier, she was a student of Xavier. He said, you don't know? How come it is possible? No, because you must know that. So, when you are associated with the Christian culture, you must know the meaning. And when you are not, you are disassociated with this culture, you can't understand what are the context of this particular word and what are the cultural connotations are associated with that particular word. So, the amount of cultural knowledge or the background you have, you understand the text in a better manner. A reader must have at least a minimal understanding of the conventions of literature to process the content of a literary work in a coherent way. Unless and until you know the conventions of literature, see, if you are studying English drama or Greek drama, and if you know, don't know what is a chorus or what is the convention of chorus, you may fail to understand why it is there in the beginning, right? Uh, like in our Sanskrit literature also, they invoke the God, right? Invocation to God is there. In the same manner in, in this English literature and Greek literature, there is invocation to God. They, uh, the, the, the Devi, this goddess is called the goddess of Muse. 
like our Saraswati Devi. And they invoke this goddess and they go ahead. The poet uh, start writing. So we might compare the use of external information to aid the interpretation of a literary text to the activities of its creator who interprets the workings of the nature in the world. See, unless and until you have any outside information regarding the creator, regarding his context, regarding the situation he was facing, you cannot understand why he is writing a particular piece of literature. For instance, the beauty of the stars can be appreciated without being an expert in astronomy. Yes, right. Even if I am, a, I am not a student of astronomy, I am not an expert of astronomy, I can appreciate the beauty. I can enjoy the beauty. I can love those stars in the sky. But even the most seemingly naive appreciation of the beauty of nature involves a complex process of cultural conditioning. When I describe the nature, it will reflect my own cultural conditioning. How and why? You may have a question. See, in English literature, the most popular nature poets are William Wordsworth, S.T. Coleridge, uh, Keats, and P.B. Shelley. These are all romantic poets. And they are very popular because they have delineated nature in such a manner, particularly Wordsworth, when he is writing his Lucy poems. Hmm. Then you can feel the thing. You, you, the, the whole picture is you know created against you. And if there is not a picture, you can realize that picture against your eyes, whether they are open or closed. So that kind of cultural conditioning is there. Then a poet can you know, appreciate the beauty of nature and he can put it into words. So this realization of the words is always different in every reader as well as his own conditioning. Means poet is writing but when you are making a realization, your own visualization, realization is different as a reader. I may find out some different thing. You may find out something different. That depends upon our own conditioning, our own culture, our own background, our own experiences in past. Right? Am I right or wrong? Hello? Yes, yes, ma'am. Right. Because yeah. you may appreciate in your own way. You may have interpreted it in your own way. And I may interpret in some other way. Right. So more scholarly traditional approaches also include biographical studies. It is not merely the background or the information, but biographical studies, philosophical studies, and textual studies. So biographical studies, as I told you, if you know, at a particular poet had lived in this age, if he is a Victorian poet, then there might be some context of Victorian age. Some characteristics might be common or he may be representing his own age, his or her own age. And that is why some biographical details are very much useful in understanding a particular piece of literature. Right. Secondly, philosophical studies. The ideas expressed in a literary text when they are compared to well-known philosophical concepts and often judged in relation to the critic's own moral or philosophical stance, then it does focus or it does throw light on some various philosophical aspect. So when a poet and when the reader both are knowledgeable enough of some philosophical studies, it helps us to understand and throw some light on such philosophical ideas. Textual studies, as uh, we have already discussed, 
in which historical record is carefully shifted in an attempt to determine the precisely correct rendering of literary text. Textual studies as well as the historical record. I have later on taken one more example in which you can see how without having the historical record, it becomes almost useless to read the text. So in traditional approach, the work of art frequently appears to be a source that illustrates background. In traditional approach, the only work of art does not mean anything. So without having any background, you cannot evaluate, you cannot judge it, you cannot understand it. We have seen one example of it. And such an approach often leads to the study of literature as essentially biography, history, or some other branch of learning rather than as an art. Now, this is an argument which makes this traditional approach, you know, which argues against the traditional approach. So we have to see the things both the ways, whether traditional approaches are helpful in understanding and appreciating and interpreting the particular text, or they are useless, or they are misleading you. Here, the argument is that this biography, history, or some other social context may lead your literary piece to another branch of learning rather than as an art. Now, uh, let me have your own opinion. Do you think so? That when you know the social background, historical background, or biographical background, your appreciation of art will be misleading you or it will be leading you to some other, other branch. I think it will lead to the some other branch because uh, knowing the details, we can relate to it uh, more uh, deeply or uh, more per, no, precisely. Hmm. Yeah. So do, do you think that it is useless or it should not be applied? While evaluating a text, you should not study the biography. You should not have any external information. You should not know about the context, historical context or social context of the author. No, We should know yes. because uh, unless and until we know the details about the writer or the poet, how can we relate to him and know that in which situation he has written that, uh, you know, uh, the exactly. context. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. When you know... Even, this... Ma'am, even if you see the Ramayana and yeah. Mahabharata, we can't interpret it well, well if you if we don't know such cultural aspects of that background where the Kata happened. So it is uh, really necessary for us to interpret that story, how it went, in which situation it, uh, the uh, Rama took the decision of... Uh, uh, leaving Sita behind. So yes, I think yes. it is necessary. Yeah, so background is very much necessary. See, if, if you talk about Kalidasa and the story, you know, we don't know whether the story was correct or not. We don't have evidence, evidences. But still, when we have, uh, when we uh, there's here this story of, you know, cutting the same branch of a tree yes, on really. which he was sitting, right? So he was such a fool. And then he became such a learned poet. So when you know such background stories, you may respect the poet in a you know proper manner. Otherwise, you may not. We don't we don't uh, support such uh, you know make believe stories. But still, it affects your perception about Kalidas, right? Same thing about uh, Ramcharit Manas who. Uh, who has written Ramcharit Manas? Tulsidas. Tulsidas ji. So there is one uh, very famous story about Tulsidas ji, right? That he was uh, so much in love with his wife that one night when she came to her own parental home, he went at night, you know, whether it was raining and it was raining cats and dogs. And still he went to her place 
at night in the late night and when he was standing in the entrance door she said that why why are you doing this yes. if you love in the, the god in such a manner uh, you will attain him you will attain god if you have this kind of madness for me this kind of madness may lead you to god so such stories and this might have inspired him to write ramcharitmanas right so such stories such, such information biographical information do help us this is my own perception i may be right i may be wrong as per new critics this the stories are misleading according to those of the older school literature provides primarily an opportunity for exercising what they perceive to be really relevant scholarly to be really relevant scholarly and cultural disciplines such as history linguistics biography and philosophy so these people the older school people they thought that this is an opportunity that you can exercise and you can exercise your perception and that may also be relevant in another cultural and scholarly disciplines such as history linguistic biography and philosophy so while studying a literary text you can also master all this discipline or you can have knowledge regarding this it is not a question of mastering a particular discipline but you can have knowledge regarding history linguistics biography and philosophy and they i think they cannot be what are the compartments between all these disciplines and that is why our government in national education policy have now started to put emphasis on multidisciplinary aspects of education because while learning an art when you are learning a story when you are appreciating a story you may study about history you may you may learn something regarding science you may learn something regarding philosophy right and the, i think there is nothing wrong again historical or biographical approach it focuses on the life times and environment of the author and these this does affect all these things they do affect the psyche of the author see without having any experience or intention no author starts or no author takes a pen and starts writing something right so his life experiences his times the the time in which he is living the age and the environment in which he is living all these affect his own life and you know that any piece of writing it is the result of his own experiences and this approach deals with the effect of these factors on the work of art so nobody can deny this that all these factors do affect the life of an author and indirectly the work of an art right so most of literary works can be analyzed in the light of historical and biographical method if you don't understand the impact of the age the political events if a writer is writing during war world war first and world war second see the writing is quite different Mm. and when a writer is writing in a peace time so the whole thing will be different so political historical background always affect the what we say the thought patterns of the writer so a writer or a critic who studies the work in accordance with the period in which the work is produced thus the values and perception of the reader's own age are put aside a reader a critic studies the work in accordance with the period in which the work is produced like when you study shakespearean play now shakespearean is is different and if we are evaluating in our 20 21st century now then the whole perception will be different we are not looking at the things as it was seen in the shakespeare's time 
it is solely different we will evaluate shakespearean dialogues his own settings everything in 20, in the context of 21st century our own uh, perception will be different right now this historical or biographical that is traditional approach establishes a kind of bridge between the reader and the age and the birth of the author as i told you if you don't have the biographical information regarding shakespeare how will you able to respect him because as it is told this shakespeare was just taking care of horses parked outside the theater in england so at that time there were open air theaters and shakespeare was doing this duty of taking care of horses which were parked outside the theater now while doing his duty he was listening to all the dialogues the drama and the dialogues now he must have learned something during those sessions which were going inside the theater he might not be able to look at the at the uh, what do we say scene going on on the stage but he was able to listen to those dialogues and he became the master of writing dialogues so how a man can master only having this much of background of having the experience of a drama how to write a play but he can master he could master it and he became the world master of writing plays his comedies tragedies everything you know even today shakespearean plays even in amdavad they uh, enact the plays of shakespeare today so this is how historical and biographical background the knowledge the information if we have we can understand the writer the author as well as his text <coughs> so it is kind of you know building a bridge between the reader and the age and the world of the author it is not very difficult to um to to uh, visualize or to understand the author's own world in what kind of world he might have grown up what kind of experiences he might have see if we talk about milton you must have heard the name of john milton john milton who wrote paradise lost paradise. and paradise regained now if you don't have any information any biographical information you may read the paradise lost and paradise regain but if i give you an additional information that milton was blind okay if i say that he was blind right and he made his friend to write this paradise lost and paradise regain any one of you have read paradise lost shri ji rani you must have read anyone no no i have not read it sorry no i have not yet read okay okay but let me tell you if you re start reading paradise lost the very first scene he has described in paradise lost is <coughs> a scene of pandemonium now what is the meaning of pandemonium the word pandemonium means hell h e l l hell that is the opposite of heaven now he has described the whole scene of hell in which satan now satan's name is not satan in paradise lost he is lucifer now he has described lucifer also right so uh, in when when we uh, watch ramayana or mahabharata our rakshasas you know they are described in the same way the whole hell in which fire is going on everywhere and lucifer you know with two different kind of uh, gestures he has been described and in such a nice manner when you read this description and when you 
know that the person who has described this whole scene was blind. See, how will you feel? You'll be fascinated by the art of that person, of that poet. How Milton could write this description when he himself had no eyes. See, he had now never seen the world, uh, the whole world which is uh, available on earth. Then how can he imagine the hell? What kind of hell he might have imagined and he might have written? So this kind of historical and biographical information, when you come to know about a particular author, the creator, the poet, it helps in understanding. So it helps the reader and it kind of, you know, builds a bridge between the author and the reader. And it also helps you to understand the, the age of the author. See, if you, if you have read Chaucer, this, I'm sorry, I'm talking about all English literature, which you have not learned. But Chaucer is called the father of English poetry. And he wrote Troilus and Crisid. He wrote the Canterbury Tale. He was born and brought him in 14th century. And he worked as a human of the king of that time. So, this information about the Chaucer, it gives you a lot many information to understand his Canterbury Tales. Now, when you read Canterbury Tales, Canterbury Tales, I, I don't think that I have talked about it earlier in last lecture. But now, this Canterbury Tales is, Canterbury is a very uh, pious place, holy place for pilgrimage. Now, in that age, people started uh, to go to Canterbury on foot. There are 28 pilgrims who were walking towards Canterbury. And every night, if each person told his or her story. So there is one night's tale, there is one um, old wives' tales. There's 22 tales which have been written by Chaucer. Now, the whole things take you to the Chaucer's age when you read it. What kind of an age it was. And when you get this additional information regarding Chaucer, then you understand that life of the author, that age of the author in a better manner. So, these historical events and the values of his age help us understand the work in a similar way, the literary works which gives information of the author and his own period. So when we talk about Victorian literature or Elizabethan literature, or even in our context, it is Gandhi Yug. So when we talk about lit Victorian literature, the title itself suggests so many characteristics of this age. So how the historical single word you know victorian literature the title itself suggests so many things elizabethan literature so as soon as there is a reference to elizabethan literature that means renaissance was there now what is the meaning of renaissance again there may be a question renaissance means no surgeon yes no surgeon card Ha, no surgeon, Punurutan. There was a you know uh, respect for science, you know, scientific methods they loved. Yes. They did not believe in you know black magic and in, in life there was a resurgence, and that resurgence from the religious point of view also and in life also. And in that age, then this praise started, and that is why. The whole thing, the whole life had been changed. So, with as I told you, with the name itself, with this historical reference itself, says you so many things. When we talk about Gandhi, you or the literature written in Gandhi period, then again, it say it it indicates so many things, hmm. and it itself you uh, it itself throws light on that period. Gandhi means a freedom fighting. Gandhi means India's, uh, what we say, the downtrodden people were 
living very difficult life and that is why uma shankar joshi who is considered to be one of the poets of gandhian youth he wrote one poem called bukhya janono jatarani jag se right the whole context is that when the the, the hungry people will you know start revolting what will happen that kind of poet poem his he has written uh, kalidas we already talked about him now a french critic hippolyte tain he suggested one phrase called race milu at moment in his book history of english literature now what does this mean race stands for culture and history race stands for culture and history so these are the aspects which affect the literature milu is a place or a social context so culture history and society or social context and moment is time so the time the age also affect the output of literature whatever is written in a particular age is very much the product of that period of that time nobody can deny this now emily dickinson i have added one more example her poems on life death and a gentleman caller Emily Dickinson is one of the most popular poet or poetess of 20th century and all her poems were published posthumously that is after her death here was such a poetess who did not wish to publish but after she was dead some of her uh, relatives they found her poems and then they published it her poems are such a wonderful poems you can never imagine that a single lady mm, might have written such nice poems and her, her the, the theme of her poems are life death and as well as one gentleman caller Now, if you really read these poems, they, uh, I would uh, request you all to read at least ten poems. They are available on Google. The best ten poems of Emily Dickinson's. You will be just surprised, you know, with the beauty of the words of her experience, of her expression. She has written about a gentleman caller. In her dreams, one gentleman caller comes. having a card and he comes and fetches her away somewhere now if you don't know if you don't have any biographical background of emily dickinson how can you understand her sentiments reflected in her poems and expressed in such a nice manner if you don't have the biographical information the biographical data of her life now let me tell you emily dickinson was a spinster a spinster means she was not married at the even elderly age she was a single person right when we talk about charles dickens's characters they are all colored with victorian milieu time and culture you know charles dickens is a representative author of victorian period that means all his characters you know he has written about thousands characters he has written number of novels and i think each and every representation of victorian period is available in charles dickens's novel like david copperfield so this is the product of time Charles Dickens, if he had been born and brought up in some other some other age, he might not have written this about these characters. His characters might have been different because all these 
experiences all the persons he had seen he had come across they were a, a victorian product and being a novelist he is a representative of his own age and that is why all these writers all these poets they are called the representative of their particular age now i think i should uh, read emily dickinson's life yeah one poem this is emily dickinson as you see her she was a spinster she was very weak she was almost all the time sick and still she has written poems regarding happiness enjoyment everything every aspect in life she has covered and every aspect in death she says that i visualize my own funeral i think there is one poem i have written also if i can stop one heart from breaking if i can stop one heart from breaking i shall not live in vain i will definitely try to stop that heart from breaking if i can ease one life the aching or cool one pain or help one fainting robin unto his nest again i shall not live in vain see few lines but so beautiful the wish to help others to wish add something you know some happy moments in someone's life it is expressed in this nice poem by emily dickinson another two poems i have not taken the whole poems i have taken some part of it i felt a funeral in my brain i felt a funeral in my brain and mourners to and fro see i see i, I have been dead and there is a funeral and the mourners the people my relatives my friends they are mourning and they are moving to and fro <laughs> nearby my dead body cap trading trading till it seemed that sense was breaking through i kept trading trading till it seemed that sense was breaking through i was trying to you know kind of having the feeling and that my senses broke through so this is how the experience of death is beautifully it's so perfectly rather expressed in a poem then as i told you one more poem one more piece of poem i am nobody who are you i am nobody who are you are you nobody too then there is a pair of us don't tell they would advertise you know yes. <laughs> here her uh, what we say wish to having a union with someone yes. someone like her i am nobody so if you are also nobody then we can make a pair so this also shows her wish to have a kind of union with someone this is done done now this approach the approach of traditional this traditional approach having some information regarding the biography regarding the life of an author or some historical information so it sees literary work chiefly as a reflection of its author's life and times or the characters in the work when we talk about a we have generally taken poems but when we take some novels and when we talk about the characters in the work uh, again and again i feel my uh, limitation of talking about so many characters which come to my mind but when you are not all students of english literature i limit myself <clears throat> but if we have read the buddering heights then there are so many characters which reflect 
the author's life and time but let me um, limit myself because this is not going to help you understand that thing but I, I can give you the example of hardy thomas hardy thomas hardy you must have heard about okay or henry fielding there are four precursors of indian english uh, sorry english novel and out of those four these are the major names whom you must know but as you are not students of english literature i cannot talk much about them so what our gaman critic called tain compared the work of literature to the fossil of a leaf which tells the world of a previous age not only leaf you know now, now our archaeological department or archaeological survey of india they have found out so many fossils so many avshes what we call in rakhi gadi in lothal in haryana everywhere so there even even uh, in gujarat we have received some fossils of dinosaur eggs yes and now they are making some one uh, large museum on it right so you you understand what the fossil what is the significance of the fossils is there they tell you so many things regarding the age yeah like rappan civilization we came to know about from the structures which we found there in lothal and in uh, this place uh, what is it dolavira hmm. so they tell you what kind of civilization it was the same way a piece of literature uh, even if it is a small piece of literature a small poem they tell you so many things like uh, i have taken one more poem which will tell you about the whole victorian period what kind of period it was and what why the poet is having the same feeling so a, a fossil of a leaf also can you know expose the whole world of a previous age hmm now here it is a very serious thing a serious in the sense that our history is not uh, what we say holy <laughs> or the when we talk about history it is always a history about bloodshed so john milton's sonnet i talked earlier about john milton and his paradise lost he has written one sonnet on the late massacre in pidamount now this poem this sonnet illustrates the topical quality that great literature may and often does possess the historical elements the whole poem itself has the historical context on a particular event when he came across that event he wrote this sonnet and this sonnet commemorates the slaughter in 1655 of the valencies member of a protestant sect it was a slaughter in 1655 in 17th century and slaughter of members of a protestant act now you can understand the context whenever you must, you must have read the history of christianity and protestant as is a man um this thing puritanism also so they were living in the valleys of northern italy this massacre was done in northern italy a knowledge of this background clarifies at least one rather factual reference and two allusions in the poems there are two references in the poem so without having this historical context of this particular event you can never understand those allusions in the poem so the factual historical references how they are important and how this traditional approach to evaluate to judge a particular work of art helps us if we 
don't consider these historical evidences or historical events, uh, the whole thing, the whole illusions or the whole reference will be out of place. We will not be able to understand the thing. As I have told you, we have taken the lyric poems and we have here not considered novels much. But if we consider the novels, then this particular interpretative approach, they usually treat a broader range of experience, broader than the poems do, and thus are affected more extrinsic factors. So in novels, you can find these external references more helpful. And still, we can say that it is a mistake, however, to think that poets do not concern themselves with social themes or that good poetry cannot be written about such themes. It is not that a poem can be written only on beautifully, uh, beautiful natural scenes or poems can be written on love themes. Hmm. Poems can be written on any kind of themes. It may be tragic, like allergies. Allergies are written on kind of deaths. If your friend has died and if you write a poem on your friend, how do you miss him? Then it is, an, it is called an allergy. If you feel that your friend is such a praiseworthy person or the king is a praiseworthy person, and when you write a poem praising him, then it becomes a eulogy, which is written. Uh, like stuti kehte hai. Hum devo ke liye bhi stuti karte hai. So those are eulogies. And all kinds of poem can be written. It is not that poem cannot be written on social, political, or any other uh, context. Hmm. It can neither only be nature poems or love poems. It can have any kind of theme. I will uh, ex uh, explain you when uh, I am talking about uh, the poem Break, 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 written by Tennyson. Actually, poets have from earliest times, there have been historians, the interpreters of contemporary culture, and the prophets of their people. Poets have not a single role to play. They are writing poems, but they can be historians also. They can be interpreters of culture also. And they can be the prophets of the people also. So poets are bearing the brunt of so many responsible roles. For example, Blake's London is an outcry against the oppression of human beings by society. This poem written by William Black, the London, it is written on how oppressive life of human being is in the society at a particular period of time. It was in 18th century. And he lashes out against child labor in his day. He attacks against the child labor which was prevalent in his day and the church indifferent to it see he also reveals the truth that the church was indifferent to the fact of child labor which should not be there in any society there is a child uh, there is a law against child labor today so how such things can happen and a poet can be a revolutionary poet also. It is not that he is always writing about the love and nature and life, good life, peaceful life. Against the government's indifference to the indignant soldiers who, had, who has served his country faithfully and against the horrible and unnatural consequences of a social code that replaces secular, uh, sexuality. So, so many themes he has covered. He shows that how human beings are oppressed in his society, 
how child labor is there and how even church is indifferent to these even the government is indifferent even the government is not looking at the the honesty and the services of the soldier so there are so many what do we say grievances in the poem reflected in the blake's poem the london i have taken another poem and that is an example of tennyson's poem now tennyson is again a product of victorian age the title of the poem is break 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 now what does it mean you can have so many interpretations as a reader how do you interpret these words break 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 on thy cold gray stones o sea he is addressing the sea the wild sea which is across him and the cold gray stones and i would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me oh well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sister at play oh well for the sailor's lad that he signs in his boat on the bay and the stately ships go on to their heaven under the hill but oh for the touch of a vanished hand see these are the important words on which you should focus upon oh for the touch of a vanished hand he says the hand which is vanished and the sound of a voice that is still the sound of a voice that is still break 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 at the foot of thy crags o sea but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me now if you don't have any historical background of victorian age if you don't have any background of the event which occurred in tennyson's life before he writes this you how much will you be able to understand this poem how much did you get out of this poem can you imagine what might have happened to tennyson so that he has written such a poem it is an allegory it is an allegory means now let me start giving you some background his friend was dead and he has written this poem on the death of his friend now can you make out something anyone anyone hello uh, anyone? Uh, maybe this is actually it's looking like that uh, uh, he it's talking about the you know waves which are coming and breaking on the uh, seashore but maybe it is his personal feeling how he is feeling about his um, uh, you know friend's death and he wants to break through it i mean he uh, maybe he want to break through the isolation what he is feeling the kind of uh, you know the emotions that he he is feeling he wants to break break that feeling something like that right 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 yeah so your interpretation is also because every reader has his or her own interpretation you have nicely interpreted the things the thing which he wishes to you know the first thing is what is breaking the waves might be breaking when they are clashing against those cold gray stones right the first thing is that again what is breaking then his own feelings you know his his heart which is you know which is having an outburst of feelings because his own friend dear friend has been dead okay this is the background so when you come to know that his friend is dead you can understand the poem in a better manner the grief the loss which he has felt and his own personal expression of his own feelings for his friend they are expressed in this poem secondly he has made multiple projection in this poem like he is showing the changes in the victorian period when he says the sailor's lad the fisherman's boy 
they are happy you know he says oh, oh well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sisters with his sister at play oh well for the sailor lad that he signs in his boat on the bay now for these two person a fisherman boy and a sailor's lad a boy of a particular sailor for both of them because he is feeling happy why now again the historical context if you know that was at that particular point of history the government had impacted reform bills in england during victorian age now these reform bills were better for these fishermen and sailors okay and tennison himself be belonged to this kind of class only he was also a fisherman's boy so he was happy that now my same class will be happy under this regime and this reform bills will make their lives happier again in the next two lines but oh for the touch of a managed hand my friend who was touching my hand now that touch of a of that hand is vanished it is not there his sound who was speaking to me now that is still that sound that the voice is not there right so in that manner he is representing the victorian again he says uh, sailing yeah there is one reference to um, chip where is it ha huh. and that stately ships go on it shows the victorian spirit of you know even state had to venture they went on ship and they went on you know uh, adventures and what we say trade and commerce so that spirit of trade and commerce that spirit of adventure that is also mentioned in this line and the stately ships go on to their heaven under the hill okay and in the last line but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me tender grace of a day because now it is twilight and the night is falling so now that day bright day which is dead will never come back to me because of the friend's death okay so do you think again biographical historical details are helping in appreciating in judging in understanding a particular piece of literature okay now there are some other aspects also moral philosophical approach or moral thematic criticism that you can understand i think i talked about uh, roman critics like plato horace right they also talk about the importance of morality and the basic position of such critics is that larger function of literature is to teach morality as i told you there are two poles one says art for art say second says art for morality so in one period art for art sake might, might be you know getting more weightage in another period after 50 years the critics the writers the authors they might be believing in art for morality right as i told you like narrow pant and uh, you know bell bottom pant it goes on changing every after 50 years and so this way the morality is also an important issue horace states in his ars poetica that is art of poetry that literature should be sweet and useful now sweetness has something to do with briefness also if i go on speaking you know for two hours two and half hours you might lose the charm of it so short and sweet and useful whenever you talk useful it becomes significant but whenever it is when you find it is not useful you lose interest out of it so it means literature should be both entertaining and lighting 
this is the theory of horace he says that literature should be only entertainment is not good it should be enlightening hamare wahan jo kehte hain na gyan aur gammat yani entertainment and gyan both should go to gather sir philip sidney adopts the same view in literary criticism in the defense of poesy and he said write poets imitated to teach and delight sydney says that a right poet a good creator a good writer he imitates he every piece of literature every piece of music every piece of painting every piece of art is after all an imitation right so he imitates to teach and delight and to imitate borrow nothing of what it is had been or shall be but range only reigned with learned discretion into the divine consideration of what may be and should be see the authors the poets religion is to teach and delight and that also with divine consideration this is the most important aspect which we should consider that whenever a poet is writing a poem his intention is to teach you something to please you as well as with a kind of divine consideration the next in uh, what we say order the critic comes a victorian critic whose name is matthew arnold and he adopted a real attitude he insisted that a great lit literary work must possess high seriousness now this word high seriousness was also used by aristotle when he talked about a tragedy he said that a drama is written with high seriousness he has given characteristics of a protagonist anybody cannot be a protagonist a protagonist means a hero must be like ram or krishna right and in uh, iliad and homer's odyssey they should be like their characters you know so anybody cannot be any ordinary person cannot be a protagonist the same way your language the words you use it should be also with high seriousness it should you know give you like valmiki's ramayana or mahabharata the language should be chosen which can be appropriate for this kind of theme which is highly serious the important thing is the moral or philosophical teaching we have talked about it earlier in the large sense all great literature teaches the critic who employs the moral philosophical approach insist on ascertaining and stating what is taught see all the time whatever you learn or whatever you read may not be teaching you new things it may be that you you are reading which may be already taught to you but still it is necessary and that is why the author is repeating it he is ascertaining by stating it again and again if the work is in any degree significant or intelligible this meaning will be that now textual studies as i told you that this started with um michel foucault i think i have written one slide on him but still so many slides are there i think if we have some discussion that will be more important because all these slides you can read if yeah now having this is a discussion of literary biographical background as you try to understand it is helpful to us while interpreting a work of art but there came a person whose name was michel foucault and with his declaration that the author is dead the problem started 
so much importance was given to the life of the author his experiences the events which occurred during his time the historical evidences the biographical evidences uh, the social events which affected his life all these was considered very important so far now with this declaration the author is dead the people were left to utter confusion now what to do when there is no importance of author when the author is dead you have to just look at what he has written then how the things will go the author is irrelevant the traditional methods considered to be nonsensical a threat to civilization not only that they said ki you just avoid this biographical historical background details information regarding the author don't just keep them aside but they are threat to civilization means you should never consider them and what you have to consider is only and only the text so existence of an author cannot be denied but the privilege value vanished author is existing how can you deny the existence of an author author is there sitting in a corner but the importance the significance the value which was assigned to the author now it was vanished and with this skepticism about the author about his style the mind the psyche of the author the identity of the author everything was nullified and with this the birth of new criticism occurred i mean the the critics who were called the new critics they started thinking in this direction that there should be no consideration given to historical biographical or social context these are the bibliography which you can utilize for your for the reading okay and thank you i uh, omitted some of the slides but whenever it will be required i will talk about it because i thought that today it was more than enough for you now if you have any questions i will try to answer them uh, uh ma'am i have a question um when we uh, uh, we are uh, studying this uh, uh, i mean uh, how to we you know write the critical analysis and all but uh, um this is like uh, when we talk about like our um, hindu studies mm -hmm. um uh, how can we use this when we are like criti uh, critical writing a critical analysis about uh, um, about uh, any scripture or something or like uh, how can we correlate these two things yeah see there are uh, these are the western theories right now we yeah. do not have any uh, what we say possibility of comparing or contrasting but in later stage when the advanced theories like deconstruction right postmodernism or capitalism or marxism when we study them then again we will try to you know make parallels with our hindu philosophy or our hindu uh, kavya shastra or theories what we say the criticism okay but right now uh, during this period i mean victorian age and new critics ha huh, again whenever there is an individual critic who is talking in the same manner i will mention it to you right like sasuri is talking about uh, some theories which have some parallels with bertrori right his uh, his uh, theory of deconstruction or what we say science signified and signify it bertrori uh, bertrori is vakya padiyam okay got it ma'am okay the thing okay. is yes. the thing is told about 
uh, in, a, in a extensive way we talk about vakya it is not merely a word a sign means a word right and so that way these people have given us some fragmented theories whereas our uh, what we say vidwana panditas they have given we given us the whole things out of which some of the theories have been propounded by these westerners that also we will have to find out i have found out some articles which are making some parallels but right now we have we are learning the basic theories western theories okay in later stage we will make a comparison with our uh, indian poetics yeah got it ma'am got it because anything like this westerners are teaching and giving the theory this was much more it, it was with us with our culture much more before that Mm. Yeah, you can say that. Okay. Yes, anyone else? आप हिंदी में भी पूछ सकते हैं ये तो इंग्लिश का पेपर है तो हाँ डायरेक्ट वेस्टर्न थियरी नाउ दिस इज ए मॉडर्न पीरियड यू कैन से विक्टोरियन पीरियड और सो वट एवर ये तो तीन चालीस पचास सौ साल दो सौ साल की बात है हुँ. तो इस थियरी और हिंदू स्टडी मतलब ये थियरी का सिग्निफिकेंस इसका इंपैक्ट हिंदू स्टडीज के साथ में कैसे होगा सी आप हमें ये देखना है हाउ बोध थिंग्स आर डिफरेंट एज वेल एज हाउ हिंदू स्टडीज is superior to these western theories yes. right aur oh, oh. agar jab tak hum western theories ko padhenge nahi ha ha tab tak yes. hum uska compare